All right, well, today we're going to continue this series, we're going to wrap this series up, actually, Have Mercy, where we're just looking at some of the um, issues that we confront in our society and kind of, you know, think about them from a biblical point of view. Uh, yeah, so today I'm going to be reading from uh, John chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at a few different verses, I'm going to kind of chop it up a little bit. Um, but we're going to begin around verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For the Jews did not associate with Samaritans. Well, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. This is the word of God for the people of God today. And everybody said, amen. Well, back in the 19th century, around 1865, uh, the whole nation and Congress was fighting about and discussing and debating uh, the addition of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution. Uh, Now, the 13th Amendment was not all that controversial because the 13th Amendment abolished slavery in um, the United States and and all of its territories. And the the outcome of the Civil War uh, kind of settled that issue, so that wasn't too controversial. But the 14th and 15th Amendment were controversial because what they did was propose to extend full citizenship rights to African Americans and voting rights to African Americans. And even people who had been anti-slavery were not quite ready to take that step to offer full citizenship rights with all of those rights and privileges and responsibilities to African Americans. For one thing, that whole prospect of doing that opened up a whole can of worms. It opened up the possibility of needing to offer those rights also to Indians and to Chinese and to Irish Catholics and even to women. Women, if you can believe it. That's where people were at in those days. That's the way they thought. Now, there were many people who actually actually thought, or they were struggling with, the idea that African Americans, specifically, were even fully human or worthy of personhood. Now, again, I'm just saying, that's the way people thought. Now, We should not be too judgmental about people of the past. I've said this before. Because nobody can see except by the light that they're given to see. 
And at any certain point in history, people just see by the light that they're given to see. And there are blind spots. And believe me, there will be people, probably sooner than we think, that are going to be looking back at our generation and they're going to be saying, what were they thinking? And I'm just saying in the 19th century, that's what they were thinking. But here's the thing. What began to change people's minds about full citizenship for African Americans, what began to change their minds was the performance of African Americans on the battlefield in the Civil War. In those last couple of years of the Civil War, they began to create troops of African American soldiers. And there were soldiers, you know, battlefield commanders who had been adamantly opposed to ever bringing African Americans to the front who changed their minds once they saw how valiantly and how bravely they fought for their freedom. It blew their minds. It changed their minds. And as those stories began to get back to people who had up to that point been just sort of operating operating out of ignorance, mostly, of African Americans, it began to change their minds. The change, the the, the facts on the ground began to change people's perception. And because of that, those amendments to give African Americans full citizenship and, in a sense, personhood, they passed and they were brought into the Constitution. Now, we all know that no human being can confer personhood on somebody else. Personhood is something that comes with life itself. But what they were doing was recognizing what already existed. That African Americans and others, soon to be everybody, enjoyed full rights of citizenship, human rights, and certainly personhood. Personhood. Jesus' ministry, throughout his ministry, and, and still today, is really about changing people's perceptions. Changing people's perceptions about ourselves and about other people and about God and what it means to know God and be known by God. That's Jesus' mission. And it's what he was really about in this story that we read today from the book of John. When Jesus came down into this country of Samaria and he sat down at a well and he began to speak with this Samaritan woman. Now, we talked before about the relationship between Jews and Samaritans in these days. They hated each other. They were filled with contempt. Uh, for each other, and there was a reason for that. There was a long history to that kind of animosity, and I'm going to go into it just a little bit here because I think it's, it's, it's worthwhile knowing. About 900 years before the time of Jesus, the nation of Israel, God's people, the nation of Israel, was divided, and it was divided into two kingdoms, the southern kingdom called Judah and the northern kingdom called Israel. These two kingdoms, they operated independent of each other. Both of them, though, struggled to be faithful to God. Both of those kingdoms struggled to be faithful to God, and both of those kingdoms, by and large, failed miserably to do that. But the northern kingdom, that kingdom of Israel, they failed miserably, and they failed spectacularly. They raised up a succession of king after king after king after king that was uh, all into uh, pagan worship. They were not faithful to God. They allowed their people to indulge in pagan worship. It was just king after king after king. That was just awful, and it culminated in the final king, King Ahaz, who fell so deeply into pagan worship that he allowed and actually participated in human sacrifice. Second Chronicles tells us he, King Ahaz, burned sacrifices 
in the valley of Ben-Hinnom and sacrificed his children, his own children, in the fire, engaging in detestable practices of the nations that the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He sacrificed his own children to this pagan god called Moloch. Now, this kind of activity, this kind of human sacrifice was common in all of the nations that surrounded God's people, Israel and and Judah. It was common in all of those places. But the idea was God's people were supposed to be different, right? They were supposed to be different. They were supposed to be holy and sanctified. They were not supposed to engage in those pagan practices, but they did. And because it got this bad that this king was offering actually his own children to pagan gods, God's judgment had to come. And God's judgment came in the form of invasion by the Assyrians. So around 721 or so, the Assyrians came in to Israel, defeated Israel, that northern kingdom, conquered everybody, and then took all of those people deported all of those people and dispersed them all around the nations and imported other people into that region. Second Kings tells us the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon and Kotah and Avah and Hamath and Severim and placed them in cities of Samaria in place of the people of Israel. He took possession, they took possession of Samaria and settled in its cities. And what happened here, the effect of this was all of those ten tribes of Israel that were living in the north were dispersed. The ones who were left mixed with these other people that came in. And all those peoples of Israel, all those peoples, basically vanished. They were lost. The tribes were lost. The people just vanished, disappeared. They no longer were a people. So, it's within that context that this animosity between the Sumerians now and the people of Judah existed. It was a deep historical animosity and a racial animosity. People of Judah, the Jews, thought of those people in Samaria as not being of pure blood, They had a deep racial prejudice against them. They even thought of them as a little bit subhuman, not worthy of personhood. Well, it's into that situation that Jesus came into Samaria, came into that place. Now, he didn't have to. He went there. And he went there and he sat down at this well And he sat down at that well, and a woman, a Samaritan woman, came to the well. And Jesus started up a conversation with her by asking her if she would give him a drink. And as soon as he said that, these barriers, these old historical and racial barriers just went up right away. And she said, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? In other words, I know you guys' rules. I know how you guys are. I know what you think of us. I know that you shouldn't, by your rules, even be speaking to me. And if I was to give you a drink of water out of this well, if you were to touch the vessel that I had touched, you would be ceremonially unclean. I know your Jewish rules. Why are you asking me to give you a drink of water? And what Jesus effectively says is, look, all that's true, but I'm different. I'm here to do something new. I'm here to change perceptions about you, about your feelings about other people, and about who can and how we ought to worship God. Jesus said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living 
water. In other words, he's turning the conversation from a conversation about drinking water to a conversation about knowing God. He goes on, he says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will, will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What Jesus was doing here was expanding her idea of God's purpose for them and for the Jewish people, that what God was doing was offering to them the opportunity, these Samaritans, these people that are, that are considered outsiders, offering to them the opportunity to be known and to know the one true God. Jesus is saying that right now, right here, in this moment, God is creating an atmosphere where all people will be able to know God. No matter who they are, no matter their race, no matter their ethnicity, no matter their background, all people will be gathered in to God. You don't have to be anything. All you have to be is breathing. All you have to be is alive. To hear the call of God, to answer that call of God. He says, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain. The Samaritans believed you had to worship on Mount Gerizim. He said, you will not have to worship on this mountain, nor in Jerusalem. A time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Jesus is saying to this woman, people, any, any person who's just alive and seeks to worship God in spirit and truth will be worshiping the one true God. And it doesn't matter who you are. Now, the fact is, there were people in Jesus' day who believed that Samaritans were unworthy, to call out and to, to hear the voice of the one true God. In fact, as I say, there were some people who believed that they were not really worthy of personhood. Some would even have said that they weren't worthy of life. In the same way that in our not-too-distant past, people believed that African Americans were not worthy and maybe not even possessing full personhood. Now, thank goodness, you know, we don't live in that kind of time anymore. We don't live in a time where whole classes of people are considered to be uh, subhuman or, or without personhood. We don't have any policies or laws that discriminate in that kind of way that say that any class of people is without human rights, without personhood, except one, actually, except one. One class of persons. And that's the unborn. We do have policies and laws in place that devalue uh, and deny the personhood of the unborn. I know that one of the arguments is that the unborn are not really persons, that they're not possessing of personhood. I get that, but I don't think that there's any biblical support for that. I like to go to Psalm 139, verse 13, where David who wrote the psalm, conceives of himself. He thinks of himself in the womb in that early, early stage of development, but he pictures himself being known by God. God knows him. He says, you, God, created my inmost being. 
you, God, knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. David conceives of himself in the womb as being known by God. And he sees himself as himself, as having personhood. He says, you created my, David, inmost being. You knit me, David, together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I, David, am fearfully and wonderfully made. What he is saying here and what the Bible's point of view is, is that where there is life, there is personhood. Where there is life, there is personhood. And where there is human life, there is God. God is there. And because God is there, human beings should tread there very lightly. Now, to me, the, the tragedy, think of, of our culture of abortion right now, is that it, it's, it just kind of doesn't even make sense. It denies personhood to this unborn child at a time when technology shows us this miracle of life at an earlier and earlier stages. We can see this, this human being being knitted together in the mother's womb. We can see it, but yet even that new information has a hard time breaking through and changing perceptions, especially when it comes up against our culture, in my view, our culture's worship, of radical individualism that says we can define ourselves and define reality for ourselves. When it comes up against our worship of sexual licentiousness, when it comes up against our culture of separating sex, from marriage and from fidelity and from family formation. When that worship of all of those things comes up against the right of a little baby to be born, the baby loses oftentimes. And the baby loses because the baby's powerless. It has no voice. In the same way, that African Americans in bondage had no voice. They needed someone to speak for them. Well, Christians have always been the ones who would speak, speak up for the weak, for the powerless, and for the unborn. Many of you know that abortion and infanticide and, and child abandonment, all of those things were common in the Roman Empire. But it began to change. Perceptions began to change when Christ came and when the church was born. The church came along and they became famous, actually infamous, for going around and rescuing these babies that were being left for, to die of exposure, to be picked up and brought into slavery. They would take these babies and raise them the church fathers from the very earliest days invade against abortion, invade against the taking of that innocent life. And the reason that they did was because Jesus had such an uncommon high view of children. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. We in our culture, a lot of times, we're hindering, hindering babies, human beings, persons from being born, being born to be known by God and to know God. We hinder them. Now, we can inveigh against, you know, the the culture of death, as the Pope John Paul II called it. We can inveigh against that, but that's kind of not enough. We need to have mercy, I think. Number one, we need to have mercy for 
one another because, as I said last week, there's always plenty of blame and plenty of shame to go around, right? All of us, everybody, either by our silence or other means, contributes to the culture in which we live. But we can't point fingers without looking a little bit at ourselves and ask God for mercy. But we also need to have mercy for young people to whom we send such mixed signals about marriage and about family and about fidelity and about sex. Mixed messages to men and women about what their responsibilities are, what we expect from people. The best way to live. The fact is, a lot of women who find themselves in the predicament, in that situation of an unexpected pregnancy, would carry that child to term if they just had a little bit of support by, you know, I don't know, a husband. But a lot of times, the young men are confused about what their responsibility is. And so they don't, they don't support that person, that woman. They don't support and stand up for their unborn child. In fact, a lot of times it's the, the men, I mean, I'm ashamed to say this, a lot of times it's the men that pressure women into ending that life. We need to have mercy and sympathy for those who are caught in this culture of absolute confusion. But at the same time, as I say, it's not enough just to inveigh against this darkness. We also need to, as the church, be for a culture of light and to support the people, the organizations, and they're out there who are standing in that gap where maybe the father won't stand with that mother. There are people who will. Crisis pregnancy centers who invite women to come in who are experiencing an, an, an unexpected pregnancy. You invite them to come in so they can see through technology, through ultrasound, they can see that life that's inside them. And then they come alongside that person with financial support, with other kinds of support, emotional support, to help that person get through that time of carrying that baby to term. And then they don't stop. They continue to help that person even after, in those critical years after. Those are the kinds of organizations that we can support, we can seek out. There's plenty of them, even here in Los Angeles, that we can support so that we're contributing to a culture of life, so that we are helping those who help women in a predicament like this say yes to life, to choose life, knowing that where there is life, there is personhood. Human being who has every right to be born to hear the voice of God call to them and to answer that call. Now, we have to know, we have to also make sure that others know that no matter what our sin, part of this the beauty of God offering himself to all of us, to all people, to hear his voice and to call back to him. Part of that beauty is the beauty of forgiveness in Christ. That no matter what our sin, but even if men, women, whatever, have been involved in this sin of abortion, we find forgiveness in Christ. Forgiveness is in Christ. Renewal, reconciliation is in Christ. We also need to understand this. And I say this with all, you know, I just need you to know this, as delicate as this is. Many of us have been involved in that kind of situation. We need to know 
that child is in the arms of God today. That child is known and knows the Father. We can be sure of that. Because where there is light, there is God. And God is there. God's there for that child, and God's there for us. We're in need of forgiveness today. Well, as Jesus uh, continued this conversation with the woman at the well, she said, finally, she said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. It's so remarkable that Jesus came into this territory full of people who were known for their unfaithfulness to God, who some people believed were not even really deserving of personhood. Jesus went to them, to her, to reveal his true identity as the one through whom all people would be gathered back to God. I, it is I, of whom you are speaking, I am He. We need to remember too, that this very same Christ is here with us right now. No matter what, gathering us together to Him. That we might live as people who know, and are known by God, who are born to know and be known by God. And can, can help others to know Him as well. All right, well, next week, we are going to begin a new series called Under His Roof. We're going to be looking at the church, the nature of the church, our responsibilities to one another, and our destiny together as a church. But this week, let's just do remember that. Where there is life, there is God. Where God is, we should tread with great reverence, a sense of wonder and mystery, with a sense of gratitude to that God who knows that every one of us was born to know Him. Amen. All right, let's go ahead. We're going